All right. Thanks, everyone, uh, very much for coming tonight. Um, so this is the Research Opportunities Panel as part of the Undergrad Computer Science and Data Science Research Fair that's uh, being organized and will be held on Friday, November 11th at the Barnard Diana Center in the Event Oval. Uh, the fair basically is meant to showcase all of the uh, incredible undergrad research that's being conducted uh, at the intersection of computer science and data science um, uh, at Columbia, right, by all of the amazing undergrads that we have. Um, so a reminder that the application deadline uh, to present at the fair has been extended to next Monday, October 31st. So if you have uh, yourself participated in undergrad research in the past, or if you have friends, or you know folks that have, then definitely encourage them to um, apply. And uh, you know, I think it's, it's a great way of showcasing the stuff that we've, we've all done on, on campus. Um, to learn more about the fair and to register and apply, uh, you know, just feel free to scan the uh, QR code on the screen. Uh, so with that, I'm really excited to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have Martha Kim and Henry Yuan, who are uh, professors uh, in computer science as part of the engineering school, as well as Professor Matthew Connolly, uh, who is uh, a faculty in the history department at Columbia. Um, we also have two student moderators, uh, Angel Liang, uh, who is an undergraduate at Barnard, as well as Samuel Hutchinson, who is an undergrad in Columbia College. So with that, um, let's give everyone uh, a round of applause and we'll get started. All right, so um, probably a good first question for a panel um, would be to ask you all to introduce yourselves uh, and your work, um, primarily focusing on um, your research and how it connects with data science. You, anyone can go first, sort of please. Okay, I'll jump right in. Hey everyone, my name is Martha Kim. Um, as Eugene said, I'm a professor in computer science. Um, my research is in computer architecture, which for those who don't know is essentially the boundary between hardware and software. And so um, we look at new technologies and new opportunities and challenges kind of at the very lowest levels of software and um, where that meets the chip itself and how to design future chips. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Henry Yuan. I'm an assistant professor at, at computer science. Um, and my uh, research focus is on quantum computing. Um, I work on the theoretical aspects of, um, of this field. Um, and you know, in, in a sentence, what is quantum computing? It's uh, uh, supposedly a, it's supposed to be a new type of uh, computing paradigm uh, where you use the laws of uh, quantum physics to, to solve problems, computational problems, much faster than um, uh, what normal computers or classical computers are capable of doing. Uh, and um, some of the big questions uh, in the area are uh, for what sorts of problems uh, you know, can we actually get an advantage using these new types of computing machines? Um, other questions are like, uh, you know, do they, um, uh, so we think quantum computers can be used to uh, break a lot of encryption schemes, for example, which is bad news. So one research question is, uh, can we design crypto systems that are secure against quantum computers? And that's one thing I'm thinking about. Okay, I'm uh, Matthew Connolly. I'm a professor in the history department. Um, I'm also the uh, principal investigator for History Lab. Uh, so History Lab is a group of social scientists and data scientists uh, who are interested in developing new methods um, for doing historical research um, using computational methods. Um, so, you know, the thing I've been most interested in, uh, this is going back now eight years, is uh, using the millions of documents that have been declassified uh, that were once secret or even top secret and using machine learning methods uh, to try to discover uh, patterns and anomalies in what the government didn't want us to know. So very happy to talk to you about that this evening. Excellent, thank you all so much. Um, so um, next question, sort of jumping off of your research, um, how would you um, advise undergraduate students to start getting involved with research at Columbia, um, primarily in, in computer and data science or sort of interdisciplinarily related fields? I'll, I'll throw something out and then you guys can jump in. Um, I, you know, I, I, that, that the scope of you know, research in comp sci and data science at Columbia is such a broad, um, it's a really broad scope and there's a lot of variation in that area. So I think you know, the first advice I would offer someone is to kind 
kind of fall of your nose in terms of topics that topics or particular courses that you've enjoyed, um, and use that as kind of the, the the thread that you start to tug on um, to kind of get some traction. So you could you know start from a course or a talk you heard, talk to the instructor, the speaker, um, talk meet with their graduate students, things like that. So you know just to narrow because it's such a broad thing where you actually start what direction you start walking in. That's usually a very effective technique. It also just helps sometimes to have the coursework, to have the background as kind of a, as a, as a platform, you know, a baseline level of knowledge that you can build on for the research work. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, definitely the easiest avenue, um, in my experience or from what I've seen is, you know, you take a course, you're, you know, if it's, uh, Super exciting to you, yeah. Just approach the, um, the you know, the, the um, instructor, the professor, and um, you just ask them, you know, about the research, um, what opportunities they uh, they might have for undergraduates to get involved. I probably imagine a lot of you have already uh, gotten involved in, in that kind of thing. Um, yeah. The the other comment I would make is that you know, there's no um, single one single way uh, of getting into a research uh, experience. Um, so, you know, just from uh, my own, um, uh, you know, how I got into research, actually, you know, I was, this was the summer after my um, freshman year in college, um, and I was just looking for jobs on campus, and then there was a research lab uh, that said they needed someone to um, make a website. And I was like, oh, I know some HTML, so I, I talked to them, and they're like, okay, make us a, a, a group website, so I did. But in that process, I got to learn about the research they were doing, which was super interesting, and then since I was already communicating with them and talking with them, um, that's sort of how I got my foot in the door. Um, and so, you know, the point is that there's many different pathways to, uh, to getting into research uh, with, the, with the research group. Yeah, um, so, you know, I'm a bit of an outlier tonight in that I'm not in the computer science department, um, and I'm very bad at coding. Uh, <laughs> and uh, almost given up on it at this point. But, um, but what I would point out is that uh, I actually have a lot of colleagues in the humanities and the social sciences who are very interested in um, using uh, data science methods to do original research in our fields. And so my sense anyway, and you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, there are a lot of computer science majors. Uh, there are only so many computer science faculty to go around. Um, so if you're looking to do research, you may find that uh, there are opportunities you know, in, in disciplines outside of CS you know, and outside of statistics. Um, like I know economists who are doing really interesting stuff. Like they've basically taken uh, a lot of really messy data. Um, in this case, like uh, uh, records of all the publications in Japan over 200 years, and they're doing like original analysis of like you know, what did Japanese people read in the 19th century, you know, and when did they read it? Um, this is actually the kind of work that people have been doing in, in English, uh, in uh, literary criticism, um, something called distant reading. You can look at the rise and fall of different genres, like, you know, when did science fiction take off? Like, when did vampires overtake zombies and vice versa? Um, like, in my field, I think it's kind of interesting to, to figure out, um, you know, how long does it typically take before the government releases secrets about nuclear weapons? And you can compare that to how long it takes for them to tell us about UFOs. Um, to do that kind of research, it helps to know a little bit about nuclear weapons and something about UFOs, and that's kind of where I come in. I have like that domain knowledge. Um, but then I need a lot of help, you know, working with uh, a lot of students and also with, with colleagues in data science. Um, you know, to figure out what kinds of methods we could use to apply to those kinds of problems. Um, so I would just point out that a lot of research opportunities may be out there, but they may not be exactly where you think they are. Great. Um, assuming that an undergraduate research assistant has secured a research assistantship through various one of these uh, means, um, what, uh, what would you look for in a successful undergraduate research assistant? What do you think people should be aiming for in terms of scope, in terms of priorities, in terms of um, contributions to research projects? I'm guessing you're going to get three totally different answers. Yeah. Like I, at least personally, I, my approach to this is very individual. Um, you know, I, for undergraduate research projects, I'm usually looking for something that's low stakes uh, because 
these are novice researchers who have not yet, you know, just starting to test the waters and gain experience. And so, you know, the context they're coming into is, you know, I have a research lab with funded grants and projects that are ongoing and certain things that we really do intend to or must critically deliver. And so I'm looking for pieces of it, pieces of the work that you know, the student can contribute to that align well with their existing skills, that sort of interest them, um, and then that are not like mission critical so that it doesn't get intense for them right out of the gate. Um, so that's sort of how I align student with the opportunity within the lab. And then, um, sorry, what was, I'm blamed. Oh, um, yeah, it's, um, traits that you would look for in a oh, successful yes, undergraduate. Thank you. <laughs> Goodness, just total, totally gone. Um, it, the ability to kind of learn on the go. Um, you know, just the nature of research is that you're doing things that have never been done before um, by design. That's its inherent quality. And so, you know, there's, there is no textbook, there is no, um, there is no tutorial. There are tutorials for parts of it, but by definition, you're kind of having to figure out as you go. So, you know, some element of grit and ability to self-study and puzzle through stuff that it's just not gonna make sense. Um, so, um, sorry, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I should have broken it down at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> sort of the, 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 the big question is, um, what does a successful undergraduate um, research experience look like? What kind of qualities do you look for in a successful undergraduate researcher? Yeah. Um, and sort of what kind of scope should people expect going into an undergraduate research job? Yeah, so... Um, um, you know, so I, like I said, I work on theoretical research. So what I do is, you know, I'm in the computer science department, but I rarely do any coding. Um, it's all math. And so for these kind of theoretical projects, it's a little tougher generally for, um, for people to get into because in order to really get started on a, a project, uh, you know, to make some sort of contribution, you need to have some uh, minimum background in, you know, say, linear algebra, probability theory, theoretical computer science. Um, so typically for the research projects uh, that um, I run with undergrads, you know, it's usually third or fourth year. Um, but even if you, know, you don't have the background, um, the, the starting point is to, uh, to get someone uh, reading papers um, and uh, it's just learning the background material. Um, and um, when I work with uh, undergraduate students, we, you know, we will sort of say, um, let's just meet every week. Um, and uh, you know maybe let's read this paper or read this chapter in the textbook and just you know tell me what you learned and so it's more of in this interactive uh, process and um, sometimes the result of this research experience is not so much original research but more kind of like a directed learning um, experience which is totally fine you know that's great it's I think for the students very helpful and um, depending on how much the time the student has um, you know maybe they're working with me for a year or so um, in the, you know, after a semester of learning and reading, maybe they can start to think about some, uh, you know, toy research problems. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the theoretical problems are, are, are challenging to solve, you know, even for professional researchers. Uh, and so in some sense, I don't ex necessarily expect, you know, a theorem to be proved or, but um, the important thing is just to really explore the area and, you know, we'll, we'll be learning uh, some papers together um, and if the, at the end, both myself and the, the student learn something, I consider that a success. Um, and you know, that's in, in theory, that's really some, sometimes that's like the best you can hope for. And once in a while, if you prove a theorem, that's that's amazing, that's great. Um, but not you know not you know it's not required. You know, not necessarily expected. Um, in terms of traits that are uh, you know that I like to look for, um, definitely yeah, um, you know, ability to to learn on the fly, to you know read through poorly written theory papers and try to parse, you know, what, uh, what the heck people are trying to, what they mean and um, persistence, uh, right? Like, you know, like Martha was saying, you really have to sort of uh, wade through uncertainty and not knowing where things are going and, and, you know, you have this optimism that things will eventually come together in terms of understanding. Um, and then finally, maybe a more general thing, which is just, um, it's, it's very helpful to be in constant um, communication um, in, in the sense it's nice to, I, I like it if, um, you know, every week I you know, meet with a student and even if it's like a short meeting, just some update like, hey, I, I tried reading through this and I, you know, it's okay to say, I totally did not understand this, this section of the paper, but I tried reading it and this is what I thought. And um, even something like that is, is really useful and helpful. Um, it's much better than, 
you know, starting off the semester, like, okay, read this paper, and then, you know, you struggle through it, and, you know, you, you don't reach out, and, um, and, you know, you come back two months later and say, I still don't understand the paper. Um, that's, you know, not as effective learning for either the faculty member and the student. So, I, you know, I think regular communication, even short, short amounts, is, is um, helpful. Yeah, um, so when Sam asked us, he asked specifically about, like, once you've gotten your research assistantship, right? Um, but, of course, you know, uh, it can be hard, like, just to walk in, right, to office hours and end up with, a, with an RA, RA ship. So um, I've actually found over the years, and I've been doing this for longer, I think, than anyone here, the best RAs I've ever had have been the ones who are volunteers, you know, who just kind of show up and express some interest, um, and, you know, I say, and it's a little bit like what you said, right? I mean, you wouldn't necessarily give somebody you don't know very well uh, something that is mission critical. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll give somebody something that I think would be interesting to explore, but, like, I don't have the time to do it, and the people who are being funded by grants for my projects, I can't ask them to do it because they've got grant-funded work to do and we have deadlines to meet. And so, you know, Sam has some experience of this. <laughs> a few weeks ago in our lab, in a history lab, we had a meeting and I said, okay, here are three ideas. These are things I've long thought would be really interesting um, and go at it, right? <laughs> and so Sam, um, about half a dozen um, of his colleagues, you know, ended up dividing the work between them and, uh, and we'll see what comes of it, right? Um, but I'm hopeful. But I would say, like, in general, the thing I prize most is initiative. Like, just, I love it when a student just, like, takes a project and they don't necessarily have to come every week. <laughs> but uh, what's even better, from my point of view, is, like, if they come a month later, right, and they come back, they made progress. And it's like, here's what I've tried, here's how far I've gotten. Um, and so, like, that's the best of all worlds, right, where you have somebody who, like, shows initiative, does independent work, you know, does something that's actually kind of interesting and maybe even valuable. Um, now, what I've learned over the years is that that's not necessarily something that just happens. And so um, I, because I was trained as an historian, I never work collaboratively. We always end up, you know, uh, working independently. Uh, and I had to learn, you know, over, over a period of years, like how to set up a kind of laboratory so that people were more likely to do more useful work. And so over the years, it's gotten a bit more structured in that you know, I ask for people to produce, you know, written project plans. You know, we, we have midterm presentations. Um, haven't told you about that yet. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, we, we, and anyway, so we, as we go, like, they're not just like kind of, hey, everybody should check in. It's, it's more now, like, structured in a way that I think most people find more reasonable, right? Because you can't necessarily guess what your advisor would like. And so I find it's better for everyone if I, if I try to set up a structure in that way. Great. Um, yeah, th thank you for that. Um, and now sort of more big picture um, about research in general and, and, and priorities of research. Um, and I, I assume this will, again, earn three different answers. Um, how do you balance emphasizing like, the practical applications of your work with trying to answer more abstract theoretical questions about the field, big picture things? Sure. I'll jump in again. Um, so, so as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I work in computer systems, which tends to be more on the kind of practical side. How do we build these things? How do we design these things so they can operate at scale? Um, and so there's sort of the obvious practical elements, um, which typically in a research context show up as, as research prototypes. So we'll, if we have this idea, we'll sort of mock it up and try to put together a proof of concept to show that, that it is doable, um, maybe not at full industrial scale out of our lab, but it's something that's big enough and interesting enough to be convincing, to convince like Microsoft to go do it or whatever, whoever might be interested in adopting it. Um, for the theoretical bit, I, again, this is really <coughs> specifically about computer systems research. The Typically when you're dealing with a hard practical problem, like there's a reason it's hard. There's a reason people haven't done it before. You know, if it were easy, it would have been done. And so, well, you might not know kind of at the outset what it is, but you know, and so often we start with the practical side. There is often kind of a corresponding, I wouldn't call it theoretical in the Henry sense, theoretical, but a sort of mathematical or abstract articulation of why this thing was hard or what was the insight that allowed us to kind of overcome this practical hurdle. And that, that nugget 
that, again, typically you don't start out with, you figure it out after the fact. That's often, in my world, something semi-theoretical, which would be sort of, you know, back of the envelope model of, oh yeah, here's why it was hard, and here's why our solution works. Um, and it's sort of a, a simple <coughs> model that articulates that. So there, there is, you know, there's that relationship that they often come together. There's just one, one piece in my world that's typically less visible. Um, yeah, my answer to that is, is pretty simple. I, I don't balance between the <laughs> practical uh, components because we don't have quantum computers yet. I mean, people are trying to build them, but um, we, we don't have large-scale working quantum computers. So it's largely a theoretical enterprise. Hopefully one day it will be practical, um, but the questions that um, uh, you know, I work on, and you know, people in my field work on. They're, you know, they're, they're of the form. If one day everyone has a quantum computer, what can we do with them? So it's it's highly theoretical, but also really um, fun, uh, creativity. You know, uh, you know, it's 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 fun because you get to be creative and, and try to dream up all these possible applications um, in this futuristic world. Um, and it's, uh, um, you know, that, that's what it is. So it's, it's all uh, theoretical and mathematical. Yeah, so, uh, you know, history is not a super theoretical discipline. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what people call theory is like kind of cultural studies type theory, you know. Instead of being like uh, parsimonious, it's almost the opposite, right? Let's say as much as possible as we can um, and explain as little as possible. Um, so, you know, w one way to think of it, though, if we're talking about like using text as data, um, like I think a lot of people in this field would tell you that you end up spending like 80 or 90 percent of your time like just cleaning the data to prepare it for research um, and people will also say that's actually really good training um, and you know a lot of the work that that students in my my group have done over the years has been exactly that has been you know like stuff like deduping and disambiguation and you know trying to improve OCR quality and and things like that and I have to tell you like it's not fascinating in and of itself um, but it's strictly, you know, it's absolutely necessary. And so, you know, when, when somebody like shows that they're capable of, of doing careful work, right, and they, they write clean, well-documented code, you know, that other people can use and so on, um, sometimes we give them that essential work, right? Um, so the work we do now, though, um, after having spent so many years now um, with multiple corpora, like everything from like 11 million pages of documents that journalists have collected, a lot of it through the Freedom of Information Act request, um, to you know this enormous but almost unusable database of CIA documents, like everything they've declassified since the 70s, um, we have like you know multiple corpora. We can start asking really interesting questions. One thing that's interesting about it is, you know, nobody's really worked with this kind of data before. Like, nobody's even, you know, until this point even begun, you know, to use um, NLP methods um, to do things like, for example, like one, one of the student projects is, let's compare, you know, what it is the State Department says publicly and what it is that they're saying in classified communications. Like, that's a kind of interesting question, right? And until now, nobody was really able to um, to answer questions like that. At least that they could do qualitative research, right? But not at scale. And so, like, this is a really like virgin territory. And to me, it's just really exciting because uh, no matter what you find, it's going to be new. <laughs> so, like, let's say you find it's exactly the same thing. I would be amazed by that. I don't think that's what we're going to find, right? But but it, if we did, that would be interesting in itself. And so a lot of the questions we're answering now, are asking now are like that. Like the, the, it, uh, because people haven't asked questions like that, they haven't had the data or the methods to do it, um, almost everything you, you can do is, is going to give you something new. So. Yeah, great. Thank you, Thank you guys for your insights. And I, I'm sure a lot of our attendees might be wondering, so um, what would your um, research trajectory be like, and what kind of advice would you make, uh, would you give to student researchers at different stages, which are like um, when they are freshman, uh, sophomore, or when they are junior, seniors, or graduate level, or even PhD levels? Would um, this be kind of a typical student trajectory? Um, your your oh, your guys' own or, research personally. trajectory. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I, I think I, I got involved in research as an undergraduate, um, but late in my undergraduate years. Um, I 
didn't even start out as a computer science major. I transferred or switched majors somewhat later, so I was sort of scrambling to catch up, but I um, had taken some coursework that I really enjoyed and, and was TAing for the course, and so I had kind of a fair amount of time with the instructor who suggested I write a senior thesis. And so that was how I, I first got involved with research. Um, and it, it was sort of just, you know, that the, it aligned very well with the course that I had taken um, and the project involved kind of getting into the, the guts of a compiler, like the, the back end of the compiler that was generating code for the processor um, and, and you know, adding a bunch of analyses so it could study the code that was being generated. Um, and it just, it sort of just was really fascinating to me that like all this stuff was happening um, in the machine and, and that I could kind of understand all the little pieces and, and tinker with it. Um, that was really satisfying. So, you know, that was sort of where I started. Um, and because it was late in my undergraduate career, I felt like, okay, you know, I'm graduating. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't, I felt like there was a lot more that I wanted to, to study and get exposed to and I enjoyed the research, so I applied for a PhD based on that. Um, and the trajectory basically continued. I continued to enjoy the research, so. Um, you know, as far as, so that, that's just for me personally, um, as far as kind of a, a student, I, you know, I think students vary really widely, especially at a place like Columbia, and their interests and kind of where they're headed post-graduation. I think, you know, there are some students where the research experience is literally just like, I need a summer job, <laughs> um, and I want housing this summer, and this seems like a good way to do it, and that's totally fine. Um, there are other students who are kind of just know that they're dead set on getting a PhD, and so they are very, you know, very singularly focused on research. Um, and then there are others who kind of just want to check it out um, and see. And and so depending on the student's interests, I think, you know, I would shape the trajectory a little differently. Um, you know, for sure, for a student who wants to apply to a PhD program, you know, if that's your objective, PhD students are typically admitted to programs based on research record or potential. So potential really, because there's a lot more research to come, but if you've already done some research or published as an undergraduate, that's that's a good demonstration of potential. Um, so, you know, those students I would handle or, you know, kind of steer differently from a student who is checking it out. It happened that students say like, you know, thank you, goodbye. Um, or thank you, I'd like to go to work in this ML lab, or you know, all sorts of stuff, and that's totally fine too. Like you know, students are all on their own paths, and you know, I might be a big part of that or a small part. That's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, so in terms of um, my own research career, yeah. So I mentioned I sort of got my foot in the door, you know, summer after freshman year, I was designing websites, and but then that led me into uh, working on actual. Uh, research problems with this group, which was, it was a computational physics group, so it was like writing um, simulation code to simulate materials and so on. Um, and then, um, you know, I was bouncing, as an undergrad, I sort of bounced between different majors. Uh, but then at, at one point I took an, um, a CS, computer science theory course uh, uh, in computer science, um, and you know, I, I guess I did well in the class, and, and then the professor mentioned, um, you know, he was uh, looking for um, something to do basically theoretical computer science research over the summer. So I was like, oh, this is re really cool. I want to learn more. And uh, it, you know, I worked in um, this research group for a few years, like uh, yeah, over three years. Um, and I totally fell in love with theoretical computer science research. Um, you know, so it was uh, just eye-opening to me um, that you, you, know, you could explore all these really fantastic abstract ideas and, and um, and uh, I didn't get any publications from it, um, but uh, in, in some sense, I think it was, in hindsight, I think it was better that I wasn't so focused on, um, you know, producing a paper at the end of the summer or something, because um, it really allowed me to just focus on learning and seeing the process of doing research and watching, you know, up close what it was like to see a professional researcher uh, doing their thing, right? And, and talking with graduate students, and, and that was um, uh, very illuminating and, and super exciting. So uh, I didn't get a paper out of that, um, uh, but I, I felt like I learned a ton about the process of doing research, and it, you know, it, it really told me like this is the thing I, I wanted to do, and so I, that's why I applied to graduate programs and pursued a PhD. 
Um, I would say that um, you know, for there's no such thing as a typical research trajectory. Um, you know, in throughout my graduate school career, and you know, uh, now that uh, or you know, meeting different researchers around the world, everyone has a different story of how they got started in research. And um, you know, some people started super early, like Martha was saying. You know, they're dead set; they know they want to pursue a PhD. Other folks, um, you know, they're just you know, they're not sure. They're trying different things, uh, and maybe they learn very late that um, research is something that they really wanted to get into. Um, so there's no such thing as a, you know, a, a typical thing. And so everyone has their own path. And what's important is, I think, is to really see, you know, is this the kind of type of work that you're, you know, you really like to do? Um, and uh, is it the style of work that you really like to do versus, say, industry or something? Yeah, I, I've been, uh, and by the way, it seems almost unfair that I'm always the one that gets to think about it the longest. <laughs> Maybe we could flip it, right? I get to get the low-hanging fruit in reverse order. You know, but I had this whole time to think about it. It's like, did I do any original research as an undergrad? And I think the answer is basically no. <laughs> I mean, I, I was a student right here at Columbia. Um, and even in turn, so I was a history major. Um, but I spent a year in, uh, at Cambridge. I did like a, you know, an exchange. Well, there's no exchange because they don't come here, right? <laughs> but Columbia students go to Oxford and Cambridge, or I did anyway. Um, and it was only then that uh, I, you know, as as they do, like at both Oxford and Cambridge, you have this like weekly tutorial system where you you sit down and you, in the old days, I don't know if they still do this, but you literally like read the paper you've written to the professor. <laughs> and, um, and that's what you do. Like every week, you write an original. Or this is the original part. You have to do a literature review, right? So you're not like yourself, like going out and doing archival research and interviews or looking at artifacts. Instead, you're reading the work of scholars and then you're analyzing their arguments and then you're trying to make an original argument of your own. Um, so that it was only then that I, I think because I was like sitting down and I was sitting across from these people, various professors and all their quirkiness, and I finally realized like, wow, like. These are human beings, and they seem to be making a living doing this, and this is kind of fun. I can just read history all week and then say what I think about it. And it was only then that it occurred to me, because I didn't know anybody who ever got a PhD. Nobody in my family, I think, ever even thought about doing that. It was only then that it occurred to me, like, wow, I could be an academic, perhaps, you know? And until then, I was sure I was going like, to go to law school. Um, that would have been terrible. So <laughs> I see that more and more clearly over the years. Um, so uh, when I was an undergrad at Columbia, I you know, had to get work-study jobs. So my first work-study job was uh, like figuring out whether all the books were shelved in the right order at the library. And after about an hour, I was like, screw this. This is terrible. <laughs> I would just like take a book off the shelf. And it's like, well, this is kind of interesting. You know? So that's why all the books are out of order. If you're <laughs> so, so I found a better job as a research assistant for a history professor. But the only thing I was seemingly capable of doing you know, was to like file his papers back in the day, like when you would file your recommendation letters. <laughs> So I would end up like reading some of those recommendation letters, which is kind of interesting. Um, but it wasn't like his research, really. Um, the, the last thing I ever did for him, when I was finally capable of what he thought was, was real work, was um, I would typed up his bibliographies. And because he was a Hungarian professor, there were like eight or 12 different languages, and I didn't know any of them. It was like Hungarian, Romanian, Bulgarian, etc. And it's like, really, another consonant? Um, so, so like my research experience at Columbia was extremely limited. Um, and you know, that's not unusual, though, among history undergrads. It's only when you get to be uh, typically a senior, you know, when you uh, either take a research seminar or you, more often, even better, if you, um, if you do a senior thesis. That's when you're uh, taught how to do archival research and how to do interviews and, and so on. Uh, which is great. I just never did, because it was so expensive, I graduated early. I never did a senior thesis. I was like, I graduated a semester early and I'm going to save a lot of money, $18,000. It seemed like a lot of money at the time. You know? <laughs> so um, anyway, so uh, what I would say though is that now, there, it's not just those writing a senior thesis, there's all kinds of opportunities to do undergraduate research, even in the history department. So like we actually give people money to like go do archival research. Like if you find out that 
you know, the research you want to do is one that requires travel, like there's money to go do, you know, to the archives where you need to or to interview people. Um, and it can be a lot of fun. Like, you might be amazed. Like, as an undergraduate, you can interview, like, former policymakers, like, very senior people. Because even these people, especially them, they think about their place in history. And even you as an undergraduate, writing your undergraduate thesis, they're already thinking, like, ah, oh, finally, I can tell my story. <laughs> so I, historical research is fascinating. And the, so the last thing I'd say about it is if you're not sure, you know, whether you'd ever want to do this kind of work, um, if you've ever gone into an antique shop and you poke around and you look at um, old things and you find that interesting, that's a little bit like what historical research is like. Um, so, you know, now we do all kinds of stuff. Now we look at millions of things at the same time. And uh, for me, that's even more fun. But. Great. Thank yeah. you guys for the insights. And as Professor Yuan just said, there's no atypical trajectory. And I'm sure a lot of um, undergraduate researchers might be thinking grad school, industry, startups. And even though you guys work in different fields, um, how do you think, um, what, what kind of suggestions um, would you give to undergrad students um, so that they can make the best decision for their own you know, career aspirations? Well, maybe I'll start. Yeah, sure. Yeah. What's her so, <laughs> so I would definitely uh, advise people not to go straight into graduate school. Um, in fact, you may find that, uh, well, you wouldn't know, but uh, I found, you know, being on different admissions committees, that uh, we're more likely to admit somebody um, who's had at least a little bit of experience, you know, outside in the world. Um, and, you know, of course, like if it's a, a history graduate program, uh, it would be especially helpful if you've done something that seems relevant. But this is more something I think people should do just for their own mental and emotional uh, well-being, because the people, you know, who started out, you know, in nursery school, and then like all they ever knew was the inside of a classroom until they were like 28 or 50. Uh, that's that's really not a great way to understand yourself. Really, you know, so I think it's one reason why so many PhD students are so unhappy, um, because. You know, if you go out in the world, you first of all, you can learn like, well, I could do different things, you know, and I could earn a living, and my work can be valued in various ways, you know, and if instead you just stay in school, it's very hard not to think that your value is determined by the opinions of your advisors and other academics, and it is a very weird world. I mean, it's a small world and a strange one, and so I would tell anybody, especially if you think you want to get a PhD, you know, to do something different for, for a few years. Um, and then in terms of other kinds of advice, let your professors know that you're thinking about, if you're thinking about going on and getting a, a PhD, um, they'll look at you differently um, and they'll probably pay more attention to you. Uh, but, but you should be serious about it so that, for example, you know, it's, it's easy for me to see this now, but professors can be very insecure. You know? And one of the things that they worry about is if anybody cares about what they do. And so, especially like, It'd be nice, right, if people outside that little weird world I described. So if as a student, you, you take the trouble to read some of their work before you go talk to them, it's like, you know, they're putty in your hands. <laughs> they're totally so happy, you know, it's like, oh, you read that? That's great. You know? <laughs> I'm exaggerating like a little bit. Um, so, so that's what I would do. And this is true even if you never thought you'd ever, or never will uh, go to a PhD program because you know, just to like, it's useful to know, you know, just like, what does your professor do? Like, what are they interested in? And, and another reason to do it is because you may find that the work they're doing is not that interesting. And then you can read the work of some other professor that you might find more engaging, right? So, you know, some people have the idea, I think less and less, young people are not sucking up nearly as much as they used to. But like, you may think that like the path to success is to flatter people. Um, you don't have to do that. You could just read their work and show them that kind of respect and then tell them why you think it's interesting and then you can talk about it. And uh, if you, know, you want to pursue a, a life in academia, there's plenty of people you could work with and you don't have to waste time with people whose work you don't find interesting. All right, that's more than you asked. Sorry, I just, I felt like I'm loading. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I, I totally echo what uh, Matthew was saying about um, go explore and, you know, um, I think, you know, if you feel like you're really passionate about pursuing academia or research, like that's, that's super great. Um, 
but it's also um, yeah also very helpful to to see what else is out there and um, ideally you know you get exposure to both you know non academia which uh, it's funny to say that because that's like 99.9% of the world um, and <laughs> academia. Uh, it's also a little hypocritical for me to, to say because I'm the only thing I've ever known was the inside of a classroom. <laughs> uh, but but uh, but really, turned out all right. <laughs> uh, but but really, the I, I really believe in this. Like you know, sort of looking at my graduate students, um, I found that uh, mo most of my graduate students actually have had work experience before they entered graduate school. And I personally uh, really value that because, um, you know, number one, it, you know, if they, after working and, you know, making an actual living and then they decide to become a poor graduate student, it really tells you that they really care about research. Um, and they're not, you know, doing it just to avoid, you know, getting a, a real job or something. Um, and second, you know, it, I think, um, you know, they, they come in with um, more mature life experience and, and I don't know, it just, um, you know, I, I think it, it feels better. Um, let's see, other, other advice, um, you know, don't just talk to the, um, uh, you know, if you're trying to get insights about what it's like to be a graduate student or what it's like to do um, research or be in academia, don't just talk to the advisor. Um, you know, we, we're all a little, you know, kooky sometimes. Uh, I think it's also very helpful to talk to graduate students, right, because they're in the trenches and, you know, they're um, in the, you know, they're, they're sort of in it at the moment, right? And so you can hear about their experiences, what they like, what they don't like, and they'll give you the, um, they'll tell you what the deal is. Whereas, you know, for uh, professors, it's, it's a very, you know, there's a lot of, um, what's the word, like uh, selection bias, right? You know, they're the ones who've sort of made it through the gauntlet, right? They've gone from undergrad to grad and, you know, so on. Um, and, you know, that's kind of skews the perspectives they have. So I think it's very helpful to, to talk to, you know, graduate students and, you know, see what it's like on the ground. Yeah, I, I big plus one to a bunch of stuff that's already been said. Um, yeah, definitely a PhD is not something you want to default into um, just because you've kind of historically been a good student because it's it's a you know it's a long time at least you know again in my subfield of computing it's a five six year proposition and in five six years you could be doing a lot if and it's particularly expensive if, if that time is spent on kind of on the on a trajectory that's not something not a path you want to be on in the first place. That you've just defaulted into. Um, but also, you know, the, Henry's comment about talking to the graduate students, I think that's really, really valuable. Um, not directly related to research, it was a teaching seminar and for early faculty years ago. Um, and they talked about, okay, let's list all the differences between you and the students you're teaching. And it was like, it really just kind of laid clear the, the gap in perspective between, you know, a professor who has a certain experience and an undergraduate. The students don't already know the material. They don't necessarily like the material. <laughs> they don't, you know, there are all sorts of just, you know, it's, it's a huge gulf. Um, so I, I think graduate students are a great kind of midpoint where they, they are, I think, much more likely to share perspective with you individually. Um, the, the one additional thought I would add to the conversation is that um, internships, you know, summers generally can be a great way to kind of test the waters. Um, be that, you know, you know, in computing anyway, there's this very vigorous industry that's very enticing and exciting and fun. Um, and so a lot of our students want to check that out, but they're sort of considering research and, they, you know, it's nice that they have alternatives. But the summers can be an awesome tool, like rather than it being, okay, I have to know what my ultimate path is going to be so that I can highly optimize my summers, um, my advice would be to kind of use the summers as an opportunity to just test the waters. Um, and if you go somewhere, lab or industry, and you like it and they like you, hey, that's fantastic. You've just got a, you've got a toe in the door. If you go somewhere and you just really just cannot stand it, well, <laughs> it's temporary. You just have to last the summer, and then you know, like that's also very useful information, even if you didn't have the most pleasant experience. And so, um, that's a real effort. Like those summers. Yeah, I can't go anywhere right now and take a three month job, um, or it's much harder. And so that's a real unique aspect of the undergraduate period that is kind of a nice tool to feel, feel your way. Maybe, maybe I'll add one more thing on, on uh, top of that. I guess um, a lot of people are, you know, you, you know um, 
with respect to like optimizing summers, I think you know sometimes as an undergrad you feel kind of anxious, like oh, maybe I'm a junior and this is like my last summer, and you know I really have to figure out do I want to go to industry or academia or do I want to apply for PhD programs? And um, one thing I would say is don't uh, is not you know um, don't stress out too much about it because I think more and more it's more common for people now, especially to say you know they they go out and so you go into industry and then you know they can return to grad school afterwards, um, and so. You know, it's not, you don't necessarily have to figure out your entire life at, at that moment. And, you know, you, there's still lots of time for you to explore and, and you know, choose different uh, options. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we'll do just one more question before moving on to the um, FAQ section. And our last question will be, um, what are some of the common challenges that you see um, undergrad researchers face and what are your suggestions uh, for them to overcome that? Uh, well, I mean, one thing I've seen uh, is that, you know, when you um, have the opportunity to do some original research, uh, and I, I teach a number of classes where, you know, I invite students to do research papers. Um, if, if, for example, like, if you like the idea of, well, I'm going to use, like, NLP and machine learning, and I'm going to study something about history, people often, like, come up with that idea, that research question, and then they go try to find data to answer that question. Um, and then sometimes, uh, you know, you could end up spending months, you know, just trying to, you know, find the data, collect the data, clean the data, to get to the point where you could even begin to do the research you plan to do. And so that's not a great way to get your feet wet, you know? <laughs> so that's why, you know, it's, I mentioned this just because this is something I've seen many times. And uh, I try to talk people out of it, and sometimes I feel bad. I don't want to discourage them, but I just see them do this over and over again. And so, you know, this is true, too, of, like, how historians identify research projects. There, there are, like, basically two ways to do it. Like, you come up with a research question, and then you go try to find the what you would call data, right, to answer that question. Or you could say, like, wow, you know, um, you know pick someone. Uh, so and so, you know, just died, right? I wonder if they left their private papers somewhere where I could start rifling through their correspondence and whatnot. And nobody else has done it before, so no matter what I find, it's going to be something new and maybe even publishable. So there's a kind of equivalent to that when we're talking about, you know, doing data science research for historical questions. Why not, you know, work in corpora that somebody has already prepared for you? You know, so. Uh, that's why I mentioned, like, for years now, like, we've been working to get to the point where we can do a lot of new and interesting research, whether it's about the State Department or the Pentagon or the CIA, or now we have agreements with the NATO archives, the World Bank, the UN. Um, we can do all kinds of interesting research, and we've done a lot of the hard work already. And so, you know, why not use data that's already ready to use, is what I would say. Now, of course, like, you could build from there, and you could say, like, well, I want to follow up, and, like, actually to answer this new question, I am going to have to, like, you know, kind of deal with some really messy data. But I wouldn't start out that way. Like, if you just want to kind of get your feet wet and, and see what you can do. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess from my perspective, you know, it's like, um, so I, I mostly work on theoretical research, and I think one challenge that I often see with um, potential undergraduate advisees that I work with is, you know, they come in and, you know, these students are generally, you know, very, very uh, smart, very accomplished, very good grades, um, but they're, they're used to this thing where, you know, you go into class and there's well-defined problem sets, well-defined uh, exams, um, and, you know, you, you study for something, it's in a textbook, and, um, but uh, research is, at least the type of research that I work in is, uh, or most research is, is definitely not like that. There's lots of unknowns, you're trying to explore, you know, you don't, some, oftentimes you don't even know what question you're looking for. And uh, one challenge is for uh, students to, uh, you know, to realize that and, and adjust to this different, uh, ex, you know, um, um, situation, and, and it's not matching necessarily what their expectation is. And that's often um, challenging, especially if they come in with the hopes that, you know, maybe they got a publication or a paper. It's not that easy. Um, uh, and, um, and so I, I think... Uh, one, one challenge is, you know, uh, if you're getting into a research uh, experience, um, you know, have an open mind and, um, you know, talk with the, you know, the faculty advisor, mentor um, about your, what your expectations are or, you know, what their expectations are. 
uh, so you can sort of get a, a clearer sense of what um, is expected of your time working on, on this research project. Um, I, I, I got time to think. I, so I, my answer is perfectionism. I think it's just a, a, a utter killer. Um, in part because, you know, like, like Henry was just saying, you know, that the problems are not, you're never gonna get a really crisp problem set statement and you're not gonna get the answer key in two weeks. You're, you're writing the test and the answer key, you know? Um, and so I think you, like that, there is no well-defined perfect answer, and so if you get hung up on that, you are just um, spinning off in, in a direction that's just not productive. Um, there's also a real practical issue, again, in systems research with, you know, there's always this ideal perfect system or perfect prototype. You can dream up all these things, but like, you're much better off just putting something together and get something running early and then iterate on it. Um, and, you know, it, just a, as an engineering, um, discipline to kind of deliver something small but iteratively is, is a million times better. But I think, you know, again, typical of like highly accomplished students, they, they are very capable and they think they, oh, it could be this, it could be that, it could be that, and now it's December. And, you know, now it's nothing. So I, I think that's a real, a real um, poison in terms of just joy and productivity. Yeah, perfectionism, I find that too. It's like often the case with, especially with your most capable students, like they, they realize that they're capable of doing, you know, amazing work and they want to do amazing work every time. And <laughs> but I mean, what people, I think it's more clear, like when you're part of a research group, but less so in a discipline like history where almost everything is single authored. But even then, research is a social activity. Like you're putting things out in the world um, so that other people can learn from it and add to it. And so, you know, when you think of it that way, you realize, like, your knowledge is not worth much if you're not able to communicate it and share it with the world. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, all right, well, um, I think we so have don't ask for an extension. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was thinking of one now that you mentioned that no presentation. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we have time for a few questions. Um, so if you have questions, would you please come step up to the microphone? So. <laughs> I am Shamarina Mastrego. This is my first semester at Columbia, but I transferred here, so I'm taking AP right now. And um, I am not sure what I want to do in the future, but do you think like doing research or just like um, asking a professor that it's really motivating me right now to join their research as a volunteer? And do you think... Um, the research would also add up to your knowledge and like uh, work with, like add knowledge to you that would help you in the industry world as well. Um, would help you, mm -hmm. you the yeah. student, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, so you just, this is your first semester. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, you, you definitely can approach faculty. There's, there's nothing to stop you um, if, if you're inclined to do that. Um, I think, you know, as a faculty member who's been approached, it's often helpful if the student, if you don't, if the student is a little more focused, like if they know, oh yeah, I've, you know, in my case, if they've taken a course with me, they've really enjoyed it. Um, I, you know, there's some basis for the approach, as opposed to kind of, you know, again, if it, if it was sort of just a kind of a scattershot approach, then it, it feels sort of random and less focused. Um, so I would say yes, definitely, but I would, I would be somewhat targeted or focused on particular areas or topics. Um, and um, as far as adding and the research kind of contributing to work in industry, I, I think it, it definitely can. Like even if you, you know, if a student conducts research and then they do not go on to do a PhD, um, you know, they've done independent work, they've had to demonstrate initiative, they've had to kind of learn on the job or, you know, get up to speed with new technologies that not have been taught in the context of the class, and all of that stuff will apply um, in industry. You know, I was talking to a student the other day, and I worked at IBM as an undergrad, and they asked me during my interview, like, tell me about the biggest piece of code you've ever written. What did it do? How did you design it? What challenges did you have? They just, like, it was the conversation starter. It was like, And it, it was nice that I could talk about something that was, like, a little murkier and 
bigger, you know, the, a good course project would do it too, but like, you know, the richer, the meatier, the more interesting, um, that can help. So yeah, it can help even if you don't. Thank you. Okay. But you, you know, you have to choose how you spend your time, right? Like, yeah. you know what you're giving up to do that, so okay. that, that's, that's individual. And the next question would be, Oh, should I ask him again? Or oh, no, no, I thought you had a question for him. So I was just no, telling him the, she wanted to ask you a question. Just the volunteering part. It, you as a freshman, you started as a volunteer at the research. Did you just approach the professor or? Um, oh, um, no, there was an ad. I think they were looking for a oh. website developer, so I just responded to the ad. Um, Thank you. Yeah. But uh, I mean, you should definitely don't feel shy about uh, you know, asking, you know, do you have any research positions available? Um, you know, worse they say, oh, no, not at the moment, and then, okay. yeah. Thank you. Office hours, and also the CS department has, I think each semester, but sure, for sure every fall, a research fair where a bunch of PIs will set up tables and then where their graduate students will be there in that sort of a one-stop shop, um, if the PI is organized enough to show up. <laughs> the other question would be, uh, uh, how do you manage the time, and also, is, is it a good idea to join a research in the fall, in the fall or spring semester or like summer when you're like more free? I, you know, I, I I think it's they're all fine. Um, you know, during the semester, it, it kind of fights with your coursework, but you're here on campus anyway, so you're not giving up I mean, giving up so much. Whereas like the summer, you're it's sort of in place of an internship or something else you could be doing off campus. So. Um, they're both fine. Summers tend to go really quickly. Um, Thank you. That's my experience. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Yeah. Hello. Um, so I'm a senior in C studying computer science and um, I made up my mind like a while ago that you know I was going to enter industry after graduating, um, but I found that the parts of computer science that I'm like most naturally kind of drawn towards, naturally interested in, naturally passionate about, generally are the parts of computer science that like require masters or PhDs at most companies to like really be able to like work with or be able to like touch the algorithms and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I found there's like many positions where it's like they kind of disguise the job opening as something that might be available to undergrads, but it's not actually available to undergrads. Um, so I guess that would, my question would be, um, what kind of areas of computer science do you think are like the most applicable in industry? Like specifically, what can you study, you know, work on here in computer science that would be relevant? Um, you know, to like a, a tech or a finance company, like, um, you know, and then like, how, how do you, you know, begin that process of, you know, kind of like engaging with like, you know, the more challenging kind of higher order stuff. Um, yeah. No clue. I've never worked at a company, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I feel like I'm, I'm <laughs> dominating. Um, I, let me try and organize my thoughts a little. Um, so first of all, regarding those positions, like if you're inclined to work in industry, like definitely do that. Like my guess is those positions, they're, if they're trying to hire a PhD or someone with a lot of experience, okay, you might not be qualified upon graduation for that position, but you could work on the team and you could like work very closely with someone who has that training and see them in action. So you could, you stand to learn a lot by working closely. Uh, I personally had that experience at IBM as an undergrad. There was a guy with a PhD on the team who was just really an intellectual driver of the thing we were building. Um, so, you know, maybe not that position, but that team or, you know, like you could be adjacent and that can be really valuable for you. Um, it can also be valuable because it might help you clarify whether you really want that person's job or not. Um, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, I have no idea. Um, but, you, you know, you might discover like, oh, that's, that's not the sort of work I want to do. I want to do something else. Or you, you, your, your thinking might shift. So that, that um, input could be useful. 
Sorry, I'm forgetting the third part of your question about the, I what, mean, I guess what I was, to look at here. Yeah, I was like, I was saying that like a lot of the kind of areas or spaces like in industry that I'm interested in, like artificial intelligence, algorithms, that kind of stuff. It's like it seems like it's hard to get into that right out of college. So I was, I was asking, what are like some areas, you know, some potential things to study or research on here that could provide like a good leaping yeah. off point to get into that down the road? I mean, I, I'm sort of speculating here because I don't know exactly the hiring processes at all these different companies, but it, you know, it seems like, you know, if you're interested in AI or ML, like I would make sure you have the background there. Um, because it's, it's sort of an awkward position to say, oh, I'm, I'm interested in working in these areas. I have not taken any courses. Like, this is this is the moment to do that. So I would definitely, like, do the courses in the areas you think you're interested in. Is it? Um, I, I, I mean, I have. Okay. All right. well, like, I haven't taken as much as other people. I mean, there's, sure. there's people who have PhDs in statistics and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. ML, so why would they ever hire me over that person? Um, well, so, the, you know, it's a different roles. So, I, you know, they would, they would hire um, someone with a PhD for maybe a more senior position or more of a kind of product architect type, you know, vision role versus kind of an execution role um, versus actually building things. Um, there, so there are different, it's a, you know, the, the, there is room for kind of all levels of training. If they're looking for a fresh undergraduates, they're looking for people like you. Um, <coughs> You can always start your own business. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I guess maybe, you know, as a theorist speaking here. Um, oh, one more thought, but go ahead. Oh, sorry. I'll save it. Um, just the one thing, I guess <clears throat> coursework is, is nice and important to have, but really what they care about is, I think what would trump that is, you know, if you had like, uh, uh, you worked on a bunch of like projects, yeah. like independent projects or, you know, yeah, like a GitHub page or something, and you show that you've done a lot of relevant things, even if you haven't taken the course, that's probably more impressive and more pertinent to the recruiter or the hire than just saying that you took a bunch of ML courses. Okay. Great. Sorry, so, sorry, sorry just the last idea that came to me was you could kind of flip it sideways and say like, yeah, okay, you're interested in ML, you have training in ML, other people may have taken more ML, but you could mix in some other special sauce. Like you could, I mean, I'm a systems person, so I go to systems, but you could do, you know, more mathematical or theoretical angles, or you could do like emerging technologies, or, you know, it could be, you know, you could bring something completely different to the table for them um, that, that might appeal. I mean, just anecdotally, like, I spent a sabbatical at Google recently, and there were people who were trained in physics who were writing code. Like, it, I mean, they, they like kind of big brains with big interests who can like just do stuff. They're not super fussy about the details. Thank you so much. freshman in C studying computer science and linguistics. Um, so I know you talked a bit about kind of the trajectory from like undergrad to PhD grad student. I was wondering like kind of what was your decision process um, going from grad school, um, continuing in academia to become a professor like, and like because I know like a lot of PhD, especially if, like for CS, like they can also do research in a big company. Like what drew you to become being a professor and also like what's your kind of day to day like? Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy like teaching and like that? Thanks. Want to take it? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I have the best job in the world. I mm -hmm. love what I do. Even if I won the Powerball and I had six hundred million dollars, I'd still come to work the next. Maybe not the next day. <laughs> I'd probably take out a yacht for a while, but like then I'd come back. And um, yeah, and so um, uh, a lot of people nowadays, especially in fields like mine, like history, uh, there's a lot of negativity. If you haven't noticed, um, you know about how oh, there's no jobs. A lot of the people saying that, like obviously have jobs. <laughs> so it's a little hard to understand. So I'm saying this just because, um, you know, I, I 
until you, uh, the questions have all been about like, how do I make money in data science? You know, and uh, there's so many other things you could do with data science. Like some of those things are like really important, you know, and necessary. And you know, we're living in a time, if you haven't noticed, like a crisis. <laughs> and so like I'm so, you know, um, obviously the historians are not going to save the world. So um, I'm really hopeful that there are more like you, you know, who are interested in the idea of, um, you know, going into academia because we do important work, you know. We're, we're trying to create new knowledge about problems that are not easy to solve. Um, and so, you know, clearly, like, somebody's got to pay the bills, right? And we wouldn't have buildings like this with the names that they have if there weren't people who are also, you know, um, starting companies and so on. But um, I would, you know, even if you have just a glimmer of an interest, in, not just in being a professor, but, like, other kinds of work that aren't just about the money, I just would say, like, just run with it, you know, because there's so many rewards, you know, um, that can easily be measured with money, but um, I just, like, not for one day have I ever regretted not becoming a corporate lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my speech. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess um, my thought process, uh, you know, academia is like this funny social and scientific and, you know, uh, thing combined into one, and, and so it's, it's not easy to, it, you know, it's a, there's some elements of luck and hard work and, you know, talent and, and, and so on. Um, so, you know, it's pretty random, but um, I think the starting point is, uh, you know, even starting as an undergrad, you know, if you, you know, go into a class or you go into a seminar and you, you hear something super interesting and you find yourself just, like, thinking about it, you know, that night and the next night and, you're, you know, you're just sort of kept up by it, um, then, you um, uh, and you know, sort of, you do, you know, you think about it at the expense of other things that are maybe you know more important. Then maybe that's some indication that um, you know maybe this research thing or uh, is, is you know something for you. And, and that was that's always um, you know since since undergrad when I got these research experiences, I you know that that was I was kept up by these questions. Um, it's sort of like the um, you know the you know the, like the antique shop thing. You know, I like poking around in, in the mathematical antique shop or something. Um, and uh, so, you know, after a while, I was pretty sure like this is what I wanted to do, and uh, you know, um, and I'm super. I feel super lucky that I'm able to continue doing that. Um, yeah. yes. I'll answer the part about the day to day, just because they didn't touch on that. I, you know, it's just one data point, but um, it's so I, you know, I think of my job as sort of having three pieces. So part of it, one, one piece is research. Um, which we've talked a lot about, um, and like within the research, the specific activities that happen there are, you know, meeting with students, um, advising them, cheering them on, buying them lunch, like you know, just you know, depending. Like in, students are like, especially over a five or six year period, that's a long time, and there's kind of a lot. You have a long relationship with them, and they they go through ups and downs, and there are times when it's just like, man, you need to take a vacation. Like, you know, it it really it just um, so it's a very kind of one on one. You know, relationship. Um, there's also a lot of talking to, to colleagues and peers, um, often around fundraising. So to you know, again speaking for computer science, I don't know the story in history, but you know we pay our students, so we pay them a stipend and we pay their tuition. And so that means for every PhD student in the lab, I need to bring in a certain dollar amount every year per head. Um, and so the, that involves fundraising, and so that means writing grant proposals. Um, talking to people who I might write proposals with, um, kind of collaborating on those things, um, socializing our research, going to other schools, talking about it, things like that. Um, so that's the research piece. There's the teaching piece. You know, we all teach basically two classes a year, um, and that involves kind of, you know, they're large in CS, you know, so um, mentoring TAs, making sure they're all doing what they should, delivering lectures, preparing exam, you know, all that stuff. Um, and then the third piece is service, which is maybe the least visible at all, um, where it's basically volunteer work. Um, and it's volunteer work for the Department of Computer Science, um, you know, on various committees. Like, for me personally, I'm on the faculty recruiting committee this year. So when we go to interview potential new professors, I'm looking at applications and I'm involved in the interview process. And these are all day affairs. So they'll come and give a talk and have one-on-one -on -one meetings all day and we'll take them out for meals. So like, 
my time's going to, a certain chunk of my time's going to that later this spring. <laughs> um, and um, so service to the department, service to the school um, in various ways, um, and then service to the research community, which is not a Columbia thing, it's, you know, for our research disciplines. Um, you know, and it varies, you might peer review manuscripts, so you, you know, I have a stack of 20 waiting for me to look at and re write up reviews for my colleagues, and when I submit my work, I get those reviews back. Um, and that's, you know, it's the service piece, um, but it's important just to kind of keep the, the community, like Henry said, it's sort of a social thing as well. Um, so those are sort of the three pieces. Thank you. Yeah, so um, can we get a round of applause for our panel? Um, yeah, and, and that's that for this part of the event. We'll have food next door.